don't start with data, start with the problem that you want to solve. If you have a retention problem, you want to look at your turnover data for employees. You don't boil the ocean and try to make sure every single data element in your system is accurate, but you focus on the turnover issue at hand. Welcome to the Data Chief. The Data Chief is a podcast for data and analytics leaders to share their personal stories and insights on technology, culture, and leadership. In the age of data-driven decision-making, an adage still bears true, people are a company's most valuable asset. No matter how technologically advanced and forward-thinking your company is, it cannot operate without the individuals that make the organization go. So how are companies using data and analytics to not only make better decisions at the company level, but also improve the employee experience? And how are data and analytics predicting trends for the future of work that includes employee well-being and greater inclusivity? Serena Hung is the global head of people analytics at the Kraft Heinz Company. On this episode of The Data Chief, she shares insights into her work and why companies are turning to this important function to design more thoughtful employee experiences. Enjoy. The Data Chief is presented by our friends at ThoughtSpot. ThoughtSpot makes it easy for you to use search and AI to analyze your company's data lightning fast. Business people at companies like Walmart, Hulu, and Medtronic use ThoughtSpot to quickly uncover new insights and turn them into action. And you can too. Learn more at ThoughtSpot.com. So this week on The Data Chief, I'm thrilled to talk to Dr. Serena Huang from Kraft Heinz. Serena, welcome. Thank you, Cindy. So great to be here. And Serena, where are you joining us from today? Today, I'm in my home in Chicago. Chicago, the home of the beautiful tulips on Miracle Mile. How are they looking? They're looking good. They are back probably for another two weeks. So if you have a chance to visit, um, otherwise, I can send you some pictures. Okay, soon. I think I think we're almost there, ready to start traveling again soon. But Serena, the most important question, the one that is on everyone's minds, what is going on with the ketchup craze? <laughs> <laughs> you know what beats me? I do wonder the same, and I hope with our analytics at Kraft Heinz, um, there's there's a huge increase in demand. Everyone is cooking from home. Everyone's eating at home. And we know that there's an increase in demand for comfort food. I mean, in the pandemic, right? Who doesn't want comfort? So ketchup goes great with a lot of products, whether it's hamburgers or hot dogs. So <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> good, for, good for the business, for sure. I'm sure there's lots of interesting eating habits that you've discovered about us in the last year. But Serena, your domain is... I would say one of the more important domains, but one that is often forgotten, people analytics. Yes. Well, it's certainly not forgotten by my team uh, or our leadership team. And I think the pandemic has accelerated the progress in people analytics in so many companies. And it's become much more important to stay connected with employees and to know how they're doing. And that has really accelerated the importance across uh, many organizations that, that I know. Yeah. And I do think, listen, companies often say people are their most important asset. But yet when it comes to data, I often say that unless you're in professional services, people analytics is prioritized lower after supply chain, after marketing, after sales. Can you tell me, so do you agree or disagree with this or how has it changed over, let's say, the last five years? I definitely see a change, and um, especially since last year, where it is now part of the SEC disclosure. Definitely heated debates going on since last year amongst my uh, my peers on what to include going forward in in the company's financial statement. Um, So I think the government is realizing that people are assets, and it's important to disclose uh, to investors. Uh, additional metrics on human capital beyond the the number of employees, right? Um, So I think that's going to become more important as we go. 
Um, diversity and inclusion, another hot topic for many companies. Uh, whether or not that's required to be disclosed, a lot of companies are now paying much more attention. Employees are demanding more transparency. Investors are demanding transparency. Um, so those additional pressure certainly makes it more important. Yes. Well, so I actually really like that investors and employees alike are demanding more transparency. One of the predictions I had made is that in 2021, data can actually reveal the huge gaps we have in diversity and equity, but also be a force for change. Do you agree with this or is this really wishful thinking on my part? No, I I absolutely agree. And we can improve what we don't measure, right? So um, certainly a lot of companies started on this earlier on, but now there's more focus in the area. A lot of, you see a lot of job postings for chief diversity officers in various companies that didn't exist before. Not that diversity inclusion wasn't important. It just wasn't talked about at the same level. It wasn't demanded at the same level. Uh, So now data is going to be part of that conversation. So I think companies who are using this correctly will be ahead. Right. They will be able to see opportunities uh, in the data and be able to make action plans to address any gaps um, versus companies that may be less mature and don't know what the problem areas are. Yeah. So if you think about the range of data sources that relates to people and analytics, there's already there's the recruiting mm-hmm. and then there's the retention there's attrition or promotions. When you think about that data life cycle, tell us a little bit about the types of data sources you're looking at and some of the changes that you've made to address these trends. Yeah, certainly. So um, I'll take it even a step before that, there's also candidates data, right? Before yes. employees get into your company, they also apply for jobs. So there's candidate data as well. Uh, so it is quite complex. People data are very messy. Having done the people analytics leader role for four companies now, um, it's certainly not easy. So we have to pay really a lot of attention to data quality before you can make useful analytics or at least in parallel address some of the data quality issues as you go. And part of that comes from standardizing processes so that um, you are talking about the definition of uh, a human capital metric the same way. And we've been on this journey for a long time. So I definitely see that effort focusing on data quality pay off for us. Yeah. Now, data quality, though, you once also said we're never going to have perfect data, especially in the people space. If you wait for perfect data, you might get five or 10 years down the road. So how do you strike a balance between clean enough data and yet directionally accurate data? For sure. So we start with the problems at hand. So I I like to tell my internal clients, don't start with data, start with the problem that you want to solve. If you have a retention problem, you want to look at your turnover data for employees. You don't boil the ocean and try to make sure every single data element in your system is accurate, but you focus on the turnover issue at hand. A lot of times we would we would do that and actually put an effort to clean up data. Um, so this this will mean a review of what is incomplete, what appears to be inaccurate, and then a cleanup effort that will last for multiple weeks, sometimes multiple months. Then we build analytics on top of that, whether it's uh, beautiful dashboards uh, or something more advanced. But definitely, I think focusing on the problem, um, that will drive the effort to clean up the data as well, because no one wants to clean up data just for fun. Right? It's not a fun job. So there needs to be a business purpose as well. Yeah, absolutely. And nobody wants to clean up the data for fun, <laughs> but, we, but we still have to do it. I don't know. Some people like this, this side of things. But one of the challenges we have with people data is also the data gaps. And people have sometimes a fear of sharing data in that it might be used against them. So they'll leave things out, whether it's related to gender or age or ethnicity. How have you found this conflicting incentive of providing the data so we can measure what matters, but then not having this used against an employee? That's a great question. So, you know, in in various companies I've been with, something that we always ask ourselves is what's in it for the employees? 
whenever we're collecting an additional data element or pushing folks to go into the system to update, if there's nothing for the employees, it's probably not going to get done. So we need to make sure in our communication, if it's a push for additional data that needs to be gathered, we're very clear on how the data will be used and how it will provide benefits to employees. So for example, a lot of times we want to ask employees about their preference, right? For career growth, what kind of jobs are interested in? Are you um, able to relocate geographically? Are you mobile? Tell us a little bit about your experience prior to joining this company. Right? All these questions are great data for the company to have. And it really does help employees, right? If, if we know um, the career interest, then we can provide better matching with opportunities that exist, maybe that employees didn't know about. So there are definitely clear opportunities, but we also have to be very clear on how it doesn't become problematic for employees who may say, I'm not mobile right now but I might be later, right? This is not going to be used against you where this is how exactly we will use the data. So be very clear upfront on on what the intention and the purpose is. So do you think this is also a matter of showing back, reflecting back to the employees, the data that you've captured? Definitely, definitely. I think certainly um, if if we have a campaign to collect additional data, we would certainly want to share back um, the percentage responded at minimum, uh, of course, without showing some of the sensitive data that can be problematic for sure. And one of the things that is a hot topic for everyone in, well, it's all the time, but maybe it's been more acute in the last year, is employee well-being. And Kraft Heinz, your team, you've done some very interesting analyses on um, how to measure this. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, sure. So earlier in the pandemic, we started to read up on research and on employee well-being being really important because we can't see them in the office anymore, right? We can't see them in person. It's hard to know how people are really doing with the small box that we have on video. Um, so we actually, um, with our leadership team support, launched our very first global health and well-being survey to see how employees are doing. And not surprisingly, we found that people were starting to get pretty stressed with uncertainty, you know, having to live with, um, you know, spend a lot more time at home it's complete change from before. Some people are working remotely for the very first time in their life. So these are all adjustments that our employees um, were having to make. So certainly we also realized from the comments employees provided, there were additional things that companies can do. Um, so since then, we have expanded upon our benefits program from you know, the EAP, Employee Assistance Program, along with providing fun things like yoga lessons at work. I led a meditation uh, that was available to the whole company last year. So these are little things that we were able to do based on the feedback employees provided to make their lives a little bit better. It doesn't solve all the problems. So this year we continued, uh, we did a follow-up as well um, to see how everyone is doing. And not surprising, the pandemic situation is very fluid. So we started to hear new concerns, right? Zoom fatigue um, that we didn't hear in the the first year of the, the health and well-being survey. And it's just gotten worse and it's it's difficult to manage. We are also a global company. So imagine the time zone challenges we have in collaborating with our colleagues outside of the United States. So all these additional challenges help inform us on what's working and where we might need additional help. Yeah. And I would imagine that you're seeing differences between the key employee groups, maybe the office workers versus the people in manufacturing charged with really getting food, making sure the supply chain is not disrupted there. Right. Did you did the data prove that out? Certainly for our frontline workers who are still making your favorite mac and cheese uh, and yes. ketchup, <laughs> um, they haven't been able to work from home. So, um, and it's very stressful situation, of course, with the increase in demand, um, a lot of them have to work more. Safety certainly is an issue. So 
definitely there's a difference between those who are able to work from home and those who can't. What we're trying to do, again, based on the feedback, is making sure that doesn't feel like a completely different community uh, between our frontline workers and our knowledge workers. So more work to be done in that space. I know many other companies in manufacturing are dealing with the same. Um, Suddenly you have folks who are able to work safely from their home office versus the ones who have to commute in, who still have to be in, in, uh, in the factories every day. Yeah, I think it's that thing that envy Mm -hmm. um, changes over time. Like, yay, you get to work from home. And then the frontline workers, it's not fair. And then it kind of flips over time because the people from working from home are lonely and they're tired of the chaos and they (laughs) want a separation of of working home. So it changes. But the other thing that your team did that I find again, relatively unique for people analytics was mining the textual comments from employee surveys. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? So on all the surveys we've designed, we've allowed employees the opportunity to comment, not a, at the end, tell us something you want to share, but after each question. So the benefit of that is we'll ask a specific question related to, let's say, work-life balance. And then we know what the comment will be related to. So it's, it's much easier to have targeted comments that will be much more useful than an open-ended questions at the end of each survey. Um, so we've done a lot with uh, certainly the well-being related questions and what people are saying in the comments. So we do a couple of things, um, certainly the sentiment analysis to see positive, neutral or negative comments uh, come in on different topics and different questions. And then we also look at the topics people are talking about within the comments. So um, a lot of times we'll see a theme around meetings. We'll see a theme around time zone challenges. We'll see a theme around workload. We'll see a theme around staying connected with others at work and that being a challenge. So, um, so we're able to look at the themes from the comments, and then we're also able to apply sentiment analysis to see which comments, uh, which topics are trending more favorably, if you will. Um, so that's yeah. been really insightful compared to what we had done in the past, which was, uh, you know, not... One, sometimes we don't always ask uh, open-ended questions. And then two, when we do, it's not related to a specific question. You don't know what you don't know. And if you don't survey somebody on that, it may not bubble up in the quantifiable data. So it's looking at that semi-structured remarks as well. And so one of those themes this year is the work from home or open floor (laughs) plans. And I think you've done some interesting AB or maybe ABC analysis related to this. So how is data informing your future of work strategies? So it is still in the works uh, for sure on what, what the hybrid workplace will look like for us. Um, something that I am recommending to our leadership team is to consider the power of experiments. Um, A-B testing, for example, that you mentioned, <laughs> um, is a really simple way to get some feedback. Um, so, for example, if you have a, a couple of scenarios you want to test out, maybe one is fully remote, maybe one is fully um, in the office, and let's say you have a third scenario of 40% in the office, you can set up a simple experiment by having employees test out those scenarios, right? Different groups of employees could work differently. And then you could ask them to potentially self-assess topics that you're you're interested in, whether Mm -hmm. it's productivity, collaboration, innovation, a sense of uh, belonging, a sense of connectivity at work, what have you, and then see which ones worked out better. I think it's a great opportunity to make a data-informed decision when it comes to return to office And it's a huge opportunity for people analytics. Yeah, I think it's so early days here. One of the leading researchers and experts in work from home before the pandemic from Stanford University was talking about how um, he actually is predicting that there will be a widening gap in workers who are remote because there will be less face time for promotions 
and that while some people are hopeful, this will be great for improving diversity and inclusion in working mothers. It, he's actually predicting it, it has a risk of widening the gap um, just because they might right. prefer more of the work from home. Right. Has any of your data given an early signal or leading indicator on this? Not quite yet. I will share that actually even before the pandemic, we've been paying attention to this trend um, because we are, you know, we we have a huge presence in downtown Chicago, but we also have some employees who were working remotely already. So it was really important to us to make sure that they had the same opportunity. So it's uh, something that we've been paying attention to even pre-pandemic. And I think that's going to be even more important as we get into the post-COVID world to make sure that we're looking at diversity and inclusion in different ways and incorporating the remote and in office as an additional dimension beyond the gender and race that we often think about. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Serena, you've worked across many companies, many organizations, going back in time to Coke Industries, to GE. Tell us a little bit about your journey what finally brought you to Craft Heinz and where do you want to see? Was people analytics always your passion? Gosh, in some ways, yes, for sure. I, I think data analytics has always been really core to what I do. I started in consulting and uh, I loved working with data. I started in labor and employment employment litigation consulting. So lots of heavy data work there. Um, and then I went to Deloitte and help companies with M&A and reorg efforts where I was focusing more on financial data and forecasting. In either case, I think data analytics is a field that is changing constantly and there's so much opportunities for learning. So I continue to to go to different, you know, different organizations. And I love the building part. I'm a builder at heart, I would say. And I really like white space. So every company I've been with, um, it, it's been really interesting to either get um, the function stood up from the ground up or build on the foundation that was already there. I think for me going forward, I, I really hope this um, whatever the pandemic brought to the world of people analytics, how it's much more important to stay connected to employees, to listen to them, will continue post-COVID. I don't see that going away in the short run. And, and I think there's such opportunity to connect more closely with the business as well. Yeah. I mean, I do think, yeah, white space, safety data, new types of data like vaccine or not vaccine, poses new challenges and bringing all of this to the cloud. How has that impacted both where you store data, but also has it accelerated your ability to innovate here or has it just gotten more complicated from a security viewpoint? Oh gosh, security and privacy for employee data uh, definitely keeps me up at night. In various organizations I've been with, um, we've always made the decision to migrate to the cloud, you know, sometime during, <laughs> during my tenure at the company. Um, here is no different at Kraft Heinz. We made the decision to do that last year in the middle of the pandemic. And we did our- In the middle. In the middle, yes. <laughs> okay. uh, we started at the beginning of the pandemic, not knowing how bad it was going to, um, going to be. And we did it in phases. So we were able to finish our cloud migration really in nine months, which is pretty impressive for the size of our company. And we did it in phases. We did the employee data last because of the complexity when it comes to certainly privacy regulations, but then also the additional security that had to be in place. You know, that meant during uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas, we were all doing a lot of testing, uh, but we're super grateful that it was it was done and, and we're now starting to be able to do more with the data and, and at least feel really secure about, about where it is. It is not simple. I would say it is definitely not simple and, and certainly uh, tough during the pandemic. <laughs> Yeah, it is. So when when you say you did your migration, is this of all the like the product data, the customer data, as well as the employee, you did all of that in nine months? Yes. Okay, that's um, very fast. Many <laughs> many organizations have this as a multi year plan. Yes. What was your time frame before the pandemic? 
to make sure we're realistic here, there were definitely some data that didn't get migrated. So it wasn't um, every single piece of data. We definitely made prioritizations on what is core uh, when it comes to employee data and what may be, you know, what we can perhaps do, uh, migrate later. So we've carved out the most important that we wanted to prioritize in 2020 so that we are ready in 2021. Okay. And so you laid out this path that you um, accomplished the heaviest lift in nine months. Let's talk about the reskilling that had to happen for your data engineers going from an on-premises world to cloud. How did that reskilling process go? It was challenging. Uh, During the pandemic, we had lots of uh, virtual. I was part of the, the training as well. We had multiple days and training everyone and getting them up to speed, have multiple modules and recordings that were made available, but all the data engineers and data scientists, um, and even some of the people, in uh, the analytics leaders like myself attended some of the trainings to make sure we understood the foundations and it's just completely different. And then giving people more time to learn as well. Uh, We've carved out, uh, at least on my team, We've powered route days where people will be able to dedicate time to learning, um, not just for their job, but also for their happiness, right? If you are on a job and you learn nothing new, it's quite boring. So uh, so we want to yes. make sure we're able to carve out the time um, and then provide the training as well. Yeah. And so it sounds like your training, it's not one and done. It's ongoing. Yep. De- definitely. Definitely. It's a journey. Yeah. Have you found particular approaches that employees most prefer for upskilling? <laughs> like, is it is it the online learning? Is it the lunch and learns? Is it the brown bags or a little bit of everything? Gosh, I, I wish we could compare it to in person, right? I would say we definitely had to pivot overnight to only virtual training for, um, for people analytics and data analytics in general. Um, what I found helpful, and we, we do our little experiments in, in our group to see what people like. So on a quarterly basis, we do analytics training uh, for the HR community. And something that we found helpful recently is the use of breakout rooms and having people do something more hands-on and discussion-based as opposed to listening to someone or a group of people talk for an hour. They're much more engaged and they learn a lot more. And we can tell from the comments uh, that they, uh, you know, that, that they share with us afterwards. So breakout yeah. rooms has been really helpful. And um, as well as trying to simulate a conversation they might need to have with a leader. So it's not so much about what data I'm looking at, but what do you do with it? So to go from interpreting data to being able to share it with the leader and guiding the decisions as a coach for HR business partners, um, that takes practice. So we create that environment uh, with the virtual breakout rooms and, and do that. So by creating an environment, it sounds like what you're doing is role playing. Yes. You're giving the analysts role playing. <laughs> so, so tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. So in, in our recent uh, training that we've done, we, we broke out the, um, the, the hundreds of participants into different breakout rooms and they had an assignment, if you will, uh, which was a, a business leader has come to, you, come to you and say, hey, my turnover rate is up in this particular business unit. Can you tell me more? So then the HR business partner's job is to, one, validate whether or not the data is correct and find more trending information so that he or she can share back with the business leader. Uh, But then two, we also challenge them to think about how else you can create value. Don't just answer the question at hand, uh, but bring a little bit more, right? Dig into other data sources. Well, what other data sources? Well, we have them brainstorm a bit on what else they can leverage. So things like exit interview, sur- right? Sur- survey data, uh, why employees left, um, and whether or not there are trends there uh, that, that can provide additional context. And then also finally, most importantly, come up with a recommendation. So here's the data analysis quickly, what we have done. Uh, and then our recommendation is to focus on X, Y, and Z areas. So we have them come back to the group uh, and then share back out what they would do, sort of like a mini role play. Um, it's been interesting to see 
how they're able to see similar, sometimes different trends in the same dashboard, in the same data that they're looking at. I think that provides an opportunity for, for them to internalize. And then also think about the next time a business leader just come to them with a similar question, what they would do. Yeah. So it's almost like teaching them how to ask the right questions, the five whys, exactly. and to be inquisitive and teaching them to fish all rolled up into one. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's wonderful. If you think about the World Economic Forum listed the top three skills increasing in demand in the future of work, they're all data related. As you look at your own team in the people analytics space, how much are you recruiting externally to bring those in versus upskilling internally? Oh, um, definitely a mix. Um, I think for people analytics, there's a lot of company-specific knowledge that's very helpful, right? So whether it's the understanding of your HCM at the company, how something is defined or previous business challenges, that's really important to have some internal knowledge. But on the other hand, it is helpful to bring in fresh perspectives as well. My data scientists have come from different industries that are not food related. And it's been interesting to see someone bringing, for example, how do you predict customer churn into how do you predict employee churn? Yeah. And that just brings a different perspective. So I do value that. And, um, and I think... It depends on how quickly you want to grow up as well. Sometimes it's faster to hire externally. Uh, Sometimes you can wait a little bit longer and build internally. Yeah, I think it's that trade-off between technical or analytical expertise versus domain and company expertise. Definitely, Yeah, definitely. Well, as you mentioned, predicting churn, whether in customers or employees, any interesting insights and particularly maybe external data that has given you better indicators on how to retain the top performers or who who might be churning? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think a lot of companies um, are paying <laughs> great deal of attention to this topic because we know externally the surveys are showing somewhere between 20 and 50% of employees are, are going to look for new jobs after the pandemic ends, whenever that is. So I know from, from experience at Craft Pines and along with other companies, the easiest data to look at are internal data points, right? Whether it's compensation related, job history, uh, some team dynamics and so on. Sometimes we forget that external factors are equally important. So there's the pull and push factor when it comes to someone staying at a company, right? Um, so something that I found helpful is to look at, uh, to find a way to measure how competitive this, this job is externally. In other words, how likely will someone poach your talent? So super wow. hot jobs, right? <laughs> super hot jobs versus yeah. stable jobs, right? Going back to the World Economic Forum, there are certain jobs that are just in such high demand that you, you're going to expect um, other competitors to poach your talent. Um, in other places, maybe not so much. So something else I've also encouraged um, all of my internal clients to think about is, can you quantify the skills data for your employees? Do you, beyond the job title, do you know the valuable skill set that that the employees have that might be super valuable on the external market? And pay attention to that. Yeah. And there there does seem to be a lot of poaching going on (laughs) as we're coming out of this pandemic. One internal data set that one of my customers shared with me, they suggested that an employee who is not taking enough vacation (laughs) or personal days, that is the biggest indicator of churn or of attrition. Have you found that? Or maybe that was an an anomaly in their industry? Um, We've been looking at the vacation data as well. And I would say that it is unfortunately such a big problem across the board. Um, We are not seeing a ton of variation. In other words, most people are not taking vacations. They're waiting until the world opens back up to get back on the road, to get back on the plane, to travel and see family and friends. So I think until then, 
it is unfortunately a, a benefit I wish more people would use uh, because it's so important to take breaks and to unplug, uh, but not quite, not quite yet. Yeah, it ties into that mental well-being and just avoiding the burnout, I think. Exactly. Um, both, both. So, Serena, we're we're both in such an exciting market and a fast-moving market. How do you stay up to date in this space? What are either the top, let's say, people, topics, um, journals, conferences, or in the data and analytics space? What are you reading or listening to? I definitely do a lot of reading, um, podcasting as well. As far as reading, I I, I think MIT Sloan Review, um, along with HBR articles, are great resources on, on what's up and coming. And I love the case studies as well that um, those those uh, organizations would mention. It's much more practical. Podcasts like this one um, certainly um, has been helpful to to me, and I recommend it to to others in my circle as well. I also do a lot of reading. Uh, a couple of years ago now, I think I read Kai Fu Lee's book on AI, uh, and I just found it fascinating to to know what other countries can do. For example, with data analytics, it's a little bit scary. Uh, but mostly eye-opening. Yeah, I do think the future is both exciting and scary. And so, (laughs) (laughs) well, I should say thank you for listening to this podcast (laughs) and being a guest on it. Thanks for that plug. (laughs) Um, But if you look ahead a few years from now, what are you hoping your impact uh, will be or or has already been clearly, but um, what is the work that you still most want to accomplish? Where do you see your role going? Oh, that's a tough crystal ball question, Cindy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I, I think there's huge opportunity for people analytics teams to definitely help companies think about the role of AI in HR tech in the employee space. A lot of times I find that my team gets called into a lot of interesting vendor demos and conversations to see whether or not the AI is simply a shiny object or it actually works. Um, and then also help think about the ethical implications of certain technologies. So I think people analytics teams, a lot of times because of the technical capabilities are in a unique situation to help companies think about that. So um, I definitely would love to make an impact in that, that area myself with my team and then see other, um, other leaders in this space do the same. The other area is uh, certainly improving employee experience. You know, going back to the, our earlier conversation around having data on skill sets, for example, having data on your uh, career goals, right? Those are data points that can help both the company and the employees if done correctly. So, um, so I think people analytics teams can help articulate the benefits of such data um, if used correctly. So lots of opportunities, uh, opportunities in that space too. Yeah. Um, so I was going to say there's so much in there with AI, the potential, but also the ethical implications When we look even at hiring, so many companies have had to back off using AI because the algorithms perpetuated some systemic biases. How have you countered that? Um, For sure. Um, There's a really interesting film. I'm not sure if you've seen it called Persona uh, on HBO Max about personality assessments and how a lot of companies have used them um, in the hiring practices and how it's being problematic for certain in certain populations. And I think, again, being very mindful of what the technology can do and the opportunities, and then making sure the right people are in the process. So, you know, similar to how I said that uh, my data scientists often get called into the, the same conversations. How should we use a, a hiring assessment? How should we use the video interview, for example, uh, what kind of data do we provide to make sure the algorithm is learning correctly? Um, And how do we also assess the decisions recommended, not made, recommended by the AI, right? Um, Those are all places where people analytics teams can help to set up guardrails, to set up checkpoints, to make sure the AI is going to be used in an ethical way. 
Yeah. So educating them, not just to accept the recommendation, right. but to use it to inform the human plus the AI. Definitely. Yeah. So I have not seen Persona. I'll have to check it out. Um, coded Bias. I don't know. Have you seen uh, on this my one? list? On my list. Okay. Maybe next so weekend. So good. So good. I actually think every every student citizen should watch it. There's a lot to think about there. But if I had one takeaway from the documentary Coded Bias is that there's more about the negative and less about the positive. Mm. And I like us to keep both in mind. It's not all bad. There's a lot of positive coming this way too. Indeed, indeed. So Serena, it's been such a pleasure having you on the Data Chief podcast. I always like to end with um, maybe one of two questions. You let me know which one you prefer. Something in the last year that's made you laugh out loud, tears rolling down your cheeks, or um, what are you most grateful for? Oh my goodness. Uh, I think I'll go with the gratitude one. Uh, It's actually something I practice with my team. Uh, we share gratitude um, with uh, a gratitude practice that we have internally and we share with each other on what we are grateful for. Sometimes it's each other, uh, sometimes it's something else. I, I would say I'm really grateful for the opportunity the pandemic has provided for people in analytics and it has increased our visibility. It has increased uh, the demand and sometimes it's challenging. Uh, most of the time it's been really good. I'm also grateful for being healthy in the pandemic and being in an organization that is putting food on people's tables. So, um, so, so far, so good. So well said, Serena. And we're grateful that Kraft Heinz has continued to get the food out there. Thank you so much, Serena. You're welcome. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of The Data Chief. To learn more about today's guest, recommend a future guest, or hear more of the show, head over to thedatachief.com. If you have questions for Cindy or comments about the episode, give her a shout by dropping your thoughts on LinkedIn and tagging Cindy Housen. Join her on LinkedIn Live the first Thursday of each month for a live version of The Data Chief, where she'll share best practices and take your questions live. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review the show. Every review helps more people discover the podcast and helps us improve our content. The Data Chief is brought to you by our friends at ThoughtSpot. Searching through your company's data for insights doesn't have to be complicated. ThoughtSpot makes it easy. With ThoughtSpot, anyone in your organization can easily answer their own data questions, find facts, and make better, faster decisions. Learn more at ThoughtSpot.com.